Hello there, my name is Marsha Lewis, and I take pleasure in welcoming you to the Sunday worship service of the Kingston Church of Christ. If you enjoy our videos and you haven't as yet, please subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell while you're at it. That will allow you to always be in the know each time we upload something new. And while you're at it as well, please give us a like and share our videos so that others may get a chance to share in the Word of God. Now, our service is just about to begin. Please stay tuned and stay blessed. My name is Marsha Lewis, and I take pleasure in welcoming you to the Sunday worship service of the Kingston Church of Christ. If you enjoy our videos and you haven't as yet, please subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell while you're at it. That will allow you to always be in the know each time we upload something new. And while you're at it as well, please give us a like and share our videos so that others may get a chance to share in the Word of God. Now, our service is just about to begin. Please stay tuned and stay blessed.
Good morning, friends, brothers, and sisters. We're happy to have you here with us this morning. What is joy? You know, when we hear the word joy, we often think of happy moments. Happy moments associated with the birth of our children, a graduation, a wedding ceremony, or just having received that special gift. However, in the Bible, the word joy is a recurring theme. However, it is often associated with moments of sufferings. Yet, in the midst of those suffering, believers often experience a joy. A joy not based on their situation, but on God's love, His deliverance, as well as His future promises, which they are confident will not disappoint. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 2, it reads, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let us imitate Jesus in pursuing joy through prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly and most righteous God, Father, it is a privilege to come before you this morning and to have worshiping with us, friends, family, as well as our brothers and sisters, God. Father God, it's been a challenging year, not for us only in Jamaica, but worldwide. Yet, God, we can be confident, we can experience joy, knowing that, God, you have provided the means through technology for us to invite our friends to worship with us, as in fact they are doing this morning, God. Without this pandemic, which has caused so much pain and suffering, many persons would not have been invited or even have the opportunity to hear your word. And so we give thanks. We give thanks, God, that in the midst of suffering, God, we can see your miracles being performed. We can see in lives being transformed. And this morning, as we hear your word, as we sing, as we fellowship, I pray, God, that our hearts will be further encouraged and that, God, we will be called to draw closer to you, God, as we pursue that joy that will not disappoint us. We pray all of this in your wonderful son's name. Amen. Amen. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the worship, worship service, service of the, the Kingston, Kingston Church, Church of Christ. Christ.
to be with you today. 1 Thessalonians 5 2 tells us the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And 2 Peter 3 11 instructs us to look for and hasten the day of the Lord. But what is the day of the Lord? And why will it come like a thief in the night? How does one look for and hasten the day of the Lord? You might be asking yourself these questions. Today, I will endeavor to clarify the meaning of this oft-used expression. The title of my message today is The Day of the Lord is Near. To better understand this phrase, we will be looking at the book of Joel. The theme of the book of jo Joel is the Day of the Lord. It permeates all parts of the message. It is actually used five times. The phrase is also used 19 times by eight different Old Testament authors, including Isaiah, Amos, Obadiah, among others. But what is the day of the Lord? The phrase does not have reference to a chronological time period, but to a general period of seismic proportions, uniquely belonging to God. It refers either to the wrath and judgment or to the general fulfillment of a promise. It is exclusively the day the Lord does not always refer to an end of time event. On occasion, it has a near historical fulfillment, as seen in Ezekiel 13, 5, where it speaks of the Babylonian conquest and destruction of Jerusalem. As is common in prophecy, the near fulfillment is a historic event upon which to comprehend a more distant end of times fulfillment. Let's turn to the book of Joel. Joel chapter one, reading from verse one. The word of the Lord came to Joel, the son of Petuel. This is all we know for sure about the prophet, his name and just his father. We don't know when the book was written, in what period, but not knowing much about Joel, does not dilute the importance and relevance of his message for us today. Let us continue reading in verse two. Hear this, you elders, listen, all who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? Tell it to your children and let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. Wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you drinkers of wine, and wail because of the new wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. A nation has invaded my land, a warrior, a mighty army without number. It has teeth of a lion and the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vineyards and ruined my fig trees. It has stripped off the bark and thrown it away, leaving their branches white, mourn like a virgin in sackcloth, grieving for the betrothed of her youth. Grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of God. The priests are in mourning, those who minister before the Lord. The fields are ruined, the ground is dried up, the grain is destroyed, the new wine is dried up, the olives, the olive oil fails. Despair, you farmers, wail, you vine growers. Grieve for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine is dried up and the fig tree is withered. The pomegranate, the palm and the apple tree, 
all the trees of the field are dried up. Surely the Lord, the people's joy is withered away. Put on sackcloth, you priests, and mourn. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. For the great offerings and the drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Alas for that day, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Has not the food been cut off before your very eyes? Joy and gladness from the house of your God? The seeds are shriveled beneath the clods. The storehouses are in ruins and the granaries have been broken down. For the grain has dried up. How the cattle mourn. The herds mill about because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep are suffering. To you, Lord, I call. For fire has devoured the pastures in the wilderness. The flame have burned up all the trees in the field. Even the wild animals pant for you. The streams of water have dried up and fire has devoured the pastures in the wilderness. Here the prophet has painted a scene of utter destruction. The reasons for God's wrath are not clear, but judgment is felt all over. What is unique about this Day of the Lord event is the means used to destroy. This is the first time God used locusts to destroy his people. For a better understanding of the destructive nature of locusts, watch this video. There is no other species on the planet that responds as quickly and as dramatically to the good times as the desert locust. Eggs that have remained in the ground for 20 years begin to hatch. The young locusts are known as hoppers, for at this stage they are flightless. They find new feeding grounds by following the smell of sprouting grass. Normally it takes four weeks for hoppers to become adults, but when the conditions are right, as now, their development switches to the fast track. As the vegetation in one place begins to run out, the winged adults release pheromones, scent messages, which tell others in the group that they must move on. And when groups merge, they form a swarm. locust eats its entire body weight every day and a whole swarm can consume literally hundreds of tons of vegetation. They have to keep on moving. The swarm travels with the wind. It's the most energy-saving way of flying. Following the flow of wind means that they're always heading toward areas of low pressure places where wind meets rain and vegetation starts to grow. 
As they fly, swarms join up with other swarms to form gigantic plagues several billion strong and as much as 40 miles wide. They will consume every edible thing that lies in their path. This is one of planet Earth's greatest spectacles. It's rarely seen on this scale, and it won't last long. Once the food has gone, the steady roar of a billion beating locust wings will once again be replaced by nothing more than the sound of the desert wind. From the video, we see the voracious nature of these insects. They are not only they not only eat everything inside, their sheer number, several billions strong, bring fear to any heart. Let me repeat that. Their sheer numbers, right? Several million, billion strong, brings fear to any heart. Imagine the noise, the swarm of locusts that thick will cause darkness on the land because they block out the rays of the sun. Earlier, I said that this was the first time God was using locusts to destroy his people. But it's not the first time he's, he, he used locusts to destroy his enemies. In the book of Exodus, locusts were one of the ten plagues used to humble Pharaoh and the Egyptians and save the Israelites. The significance of this would not have been lost on, on the Israelites in Joel's time. A plague that was once used to destroy our enemies is now being used to destroy us. God was treating their sin similar to the Egyptians. This is important for us today because as believers, we are, we are, yes, we are special to God. We are special in, in His sight. But He will not condone nor treat our unrepentant sin any differently from an unbeliever. This demonstrates God's justice and impartiality. Another point I want to highlight in this chapter is the generational legacy of the event. In verse 3, the prophet informs the people that they should tell their children and these children should inform theirs and so on. It has always been God's intention for us to share our experiences with our children. It is another way we get to impress upon them his majesty. How are we doing in this regard? Do our children know how God has disciplined us? I know there are things we would prefer to remain in the past, but these are great opportunities we get to teach our children about God. One of the things I'm, I am most appreciative of, of in my mother while growing up was how vulnerable she was. She would tell us about her sins, her mistakes, her triumphs. In return, what I saw was how God was working through her life in spite of her sins, her mistakes, her shortcomings, and her triumphs. And I am confident today that the role played by my parents is one of the contributing factors to me being a Christian. So I encourage you parents and guardians to share your stories, no matter how painful they are. You will never know how God might use it to transform your children. The final point I want to highlight in this chapter is that God is acutely aware of how to get our, intent, our attention. In Joel's time, Judah was largely, largely an agrarian and animal rearing society. People's wealth and livelihood were determined by how much land and animals they owned. The locust army would have devastated 
the local economy. And people would realize that the locust invasion was a direct result of their sins. As famine was one of the consequences of disobedience and unrepentant sins as stated in Deuteronomy. How does God get your attention? For me, it was a recent it was a recent traffic ticket violation. I was ticketed for speeding, and while getting a ticket under any circumstances is annoying. What I remembered the most was my reaction. Firstly, I thought I was entitled to a bligh. And for those who don't know what a bligh is, you expect, even though you're wrong, you expect the, the police officer to pat you on the back and say, all right, do better next time. Because I didn't realize I was going 73 kilometers per hour in a 50 zone. And when I didn't get the blag, I had an attitude towards the police officer. Some of the thoughts I had were simply, it just highlighted the ugliness that was in me. For you, it may be different, but the goal is the same, which is God, which is God wants to expose and rid us of the unrepentant sin, our unrepentant sins. This leads me to another key passage in Joel, which is chapter 2, verses 12 to 14. It reads, Now, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing. Grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. The purpose of the two Day of the Lord events, which are in chapter 1 and in the first part of chapter 2, which, I did, which we will not discuss today, is to cause the people of Judah to return to God. It's like a loving father who disciplines his children because he wants them to walk the right path. In verse 13, the prophet warns the people to rend your heart and not your garments. The verb rend come from the Hebrew word korah, which means to tear or to tear to pieces. The idea here is that instead of doing the customary tearing of clothes, which was a sign of someone in mourning, God is commanding his people to, ch to chain from the inside out. This is a type of chain God desires and honors. God is not interested in superficial changes on the outside. This was the main problem with Judah. They had become ritualistic and legalistic in, the, the, in their worship of God. And if we are not careful, we can fall into the same routine. We attend every church service. Or activity. Read our Bibles daily, wear nice clothes, but our hearts are not in submission to God. This keeping up appearance type of Christianity will not be blessed. Further down in chapter 2, we see the compassion and mercy of our great God highlighted. From verse 18 it reads, Then the Lord was jealous for his land, and took pity on his people. The Lord replied to them, I am sending you grain, new wine, olive oil, enough to satisfy you. Never again will I make you an object of scorn to the nations. I will drive out the northern horde far from you, pushing it into a sparge and barren land. Its eastern ranks will drown in the Dead Sea and its western ranks into the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea and its stench will go up, its smell will rise. Surely he has done great things. Do not be afraid, land of Judah. Be glad and rejoice. 
Surely the Lord has done great things. Do not be afraid, you wild animals, for the pastures in the wild wilderness are becoming green. Trees are bearing their fruit. Fig tree and vineyard yield their riches. Be glad, people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the autumn rains because he is faithful. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains as before. The threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow their new, their, with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the year the locusts have eaten, the great locusts and the young locusts, the other locusts and the swarm, locust swarm, my great army that I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full, and you will praise the name of your God for who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be ashamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and that there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. This is God's ultimate plan for his people, to restore their wealth, to comfort them, to get, to give them honor, and to remove their shame. Earlier I mentioned that God knows how to get the attention of his people. We see in this passage that he also knows how to redeem in full what was lost or destroyed. And to that we can say, Amen. So far, we have focused on the Day of the Lord events which have happened in and around the prophet Joel's lifetime. Now, we will focus on the Day of the Lord period which was meant for the future. Let's read chapter 2 verses 28 to 32. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will dream dreams. Your old, your, your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in heavens, in the heavens and on the earth, blood, and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance. As the Lord has said, even among the survivors who, whom the Lord calls. This passage might sound familiar to many of you, as it was quoted by Peter in Acts 2, which described the scene at Pentecost. Let us turn to Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation on the heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utter amaze, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native tongue? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Persia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, 
visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. They is only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he went on to quote the exact passage that I just read earlier. In essence, what Joel prophesied about was the coming of the Holy Spirit. There cannot be any mistake, as this is the only time a passage from the book of Joel was quoted in the New Testament. In other words, it has always been God's plan to send the Holy Spirit to guide and protect his people. Another thing we can understand from this is that God keeps his words. It may be several centuries later, but we can trust him wholeheartedly. And this leads me to the final day of the Lord period mentioned by Joel. It is in chapter 3, verses 9 to 16. It reads, Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Rouse the warriors. Let all the fighting men draw near and attack. Beat your plowshares, plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into, spe into spears. Let the weakling say, I am strong. Come quickly, all you nation from, nations from every side and assemble here. Bring down your warriors, Lord. Let the nation be roused. Let them advance in the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit and judge all the nations on every side. Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, trample the grave. The winepress is full, the vats and the vats overflow. So great is their wickedness. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will be darkened and the stars no longer shine. The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the heavens will tremble, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. Here Joel speaks of a period yet to come. It's a, it's a day of decision. Whether we are on God's side or we will be one of those bearing arms against him. Though this is a future event, we can start putting things in place from now. Are you a Christian? Now is the time to make that decision. Are you a disciple but not living like one? Now is it time to repent? Why, you might ask? At the beginning of my message, I use a passage from 1 Thessalonians 5 2, which says that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. In other words, we do not know the hour of the Lord's arrival, but we know for certain that He's coming. So prepare to meet thy God. Today, we have looked at the different meanings of the phrase, the day of the Lord is near, according to the prophet Joel. We have seen that it can be used to describe events that have long passed, events that were in the future for the original hearers, and events that are yet to come for us. Our goal, brothers, sisters, friends, should be to live in expectation for the final coming of our Lord and Savior. Let us pray.
for the communion. Almighty God, thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for the fact that we are able to come to you, to pray to you, knowing that you are hearing us. Thank you so much, Father. I pray for everything that you have done. I pray for your word through your prophet Joel, so that we can all better understand what your day means. Father, thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you. We look forward to seeing your son who came and died for us and whose death, burial and resurrection we celebrate today. Father, thank you so much for his blood that was shed on Calvary for us. In this thing we pray in your son's precious name. Amen. Have a good day. Oh,
church please listen keenly to the following announcements persons have been asking so we're using this opportunity to let you know that there will be a carol service this year online on wednesday evening december 23rd we will also be having an online new year's eve fellowship late evening on december 31st singles 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 it's our christmas concert and party entitled Tis the Season to be Jolly. The event will begin on Saturday, December 19, 2020 at 7.30 p.m. via Zoom. The chill room starts at 7.15 p.m. Come and celebrate the true meaning of Christmas. Let us smile, laugh, have no fun, and share Christmas memories. Enjoy songs, poetry, drama, Christmas stories, dance, lip sync, comedy, and surprises galore. Ladies, pick up yourself and dress up in bright colors with fancy hairdos. Men, come looking sharp. Decorate your backdrop and dance in your own space till the music stops. Invite friends and family and don't miss, tis the season to be jolly. You are invited to join our All Church Zoom Link Midweek Devotional Service this Wednesday starting at 7.30 p.m. This Friday's Teen Devotion will begin on Friday at 5 p.m. and the Campus Devotion at 6.30 p.m. Respective Zoom links will be sent beforehand. To give up your offerings, you may use the card machine at the church office on Mondays, Tuesdays and Fridays from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. You may also use online bank transfers. Get the banking details from the office, then call, text, or email the office with the type of offering you transfer. You can also deposit to the church's Scotia Bank bank account. Call the office for banking details and send details of the type of offering you transfer. For US contributions, use PayPal with the address paypal.me slash kcoc in ja to chant for funds kirk spencer the minister of the montego bay region will be delivering the sermon next week sunday we look forward to seeing you again at 10 a.m thanks for joining us take care <laughs>